Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the narrative lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. Hey, this is the podcast for October 8th, 2023. And the texts are Deuteronomy 5, the Ten Commandments, and Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, the Great Shema. As Karen Strand Winslow writes on our website, a lot has happened with God, Moses, and Israel since God had heard the groaning of the Israelites. And then God revealed, called Moses. Remember, God reveals God's name. That's going to fit in with uh, what happens next. And then there was the the fight between God and Pharaoh to decide who was Lord of Israel. Was the God of death uh, who enslaves or was the God of life who frees? And, of course, the God of life who frees. And it, that battle took place through plagues. Catherine Joy, what's your favorite plague? Of the oh, plagues, <laughs> only only because of what happened when a um, an evangelist preached it. Uh, we were we were on on uh, together, and um, he preached the plague of the frogs right as it started to rain, and it rained so that we couldn't leave the tabernacle because it was pouring rain. So he just stretched the story and stretched the story. <laughs> and then he said, when it started to lighten up on the rain, and then he said, and you want to know how it is that Pharaoh changed his mind about the frogs? And, you know, we're all like, how are you going to wrap this up? And he says, frogs were everywhere, which is how he had stretched the story. And he said, and Mrs. Pharaoh opened up her medicine cabinet and a frog jumped out and she said, and Pharaoh (laughs) said, Moses. (laughs) That is some good off the cuff preaching. Wow. He did. It was incredible. What about you, Catherine, favorite plague? Oh, I don't have nearly as good a story. I I think probably the uh, water to blood, Mm. mainly because in my mind, I see, you know, Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments, you know, and the, it was just such a dramatic scene, yes. right, by the River Nile. But, yes. yes. Yeah. Do you I'm, have a favorite role? I'm going with gnats because I hate gnats. They do <laughs> little tiny things that get in your ear, and you know, once they get in your ear canal, you can't get them out, and they're buzzing, so I hate gnats. Ugh, I'm with you. All right. Let's get to the text for today. The Ten Commandments. Well, listen. I used to be a teaching assistant for an entire course on the Ten Commandments at Princeton Seminary from Pat Miller, who was mm. maybe a person who thought most deeply, and he's got like a 300-page book on the Ten Commandments. Uh, but what I, I want to say, the first thing, maybe we can each share, share like the the uh, deepest piece of wisdom about the Ten, Ten Commandments, and I'll go first. And this is something that Pat said. Uh, he said, If you, the Ten Commandments are how free people live. God has just freed the people and now gives them this beautiful gift of the law because they don't know how free people live. If you've never been freed from something, he said, you will think these are rules that limit your freedom. But if you have been freed from anything. Yes. Yes. You you will know this is how free people live. And I had a, I had a college student once when I taught at undergrad who raised his hand. And this is about, you know, the fifth or sixth day of the semester, he goes, that's one point for you. I didn't, it took me like six days to score a point, And I didn't Ooh. know that I was, I was being scored. And this is a guy who had been freed from jail. Uh, he had a uh, um, terrible story. Uh, his, his brother had murdered his parents uh, when he was high on cocaine. And this student uh, had gotten caught with enough cocaine. He could have been charged for trafficking, but the judge gave him a chance and he cleaned up and he was living as a free person. Yeah. Hmm. He got it. Wow. Yeah. 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 I I think my insight would be uh, something along those lines. That is when, 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 um, I don't know, when a rebellion happens, I'm thinking of the Arab spring, right? Mm -hmm. Like all of the, all of the people in Egypt or many of them, uh, demonstrating to overthrow the uh, the regime then, and and it's a very hopeful thing, and you know people are rejoicing when uh, when when the regime is overthrown. But the danger then is that chaos ensues, right? Like the opposite of freedom is not is too often anarchy. Yeah. <laughs> or, sorry, the opposite, the opposite of slavery, of slavery. Uh, or oppression 
is too often anarchy. And so there have to be some some uh, guidelines, some rules to learn how to live in this new freedom, right? To, to learn how to be in relationship with each other uh, and with God. And that's, uh, that's those boundaries that I see the Ten Commandments uh, being a gift, right? To, to teach the people, these formerly enslaved people, how to live, as you said, Rolf, how to live as free people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that idea as well. And um, the way that it sticks out for me is something that uh, Stanley Harwas and Will Willimon, never know which one says it because they always write together. Uh, but uh, that they said, they said that um, you can't understand the Ten Commandments outside of worship of God. And the way that um, that 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 idea that it begins with um, God saying, I have delivered you. I've done mm -hmm. these things for you. So I'm going to paraphrase here. Let me be your God. Show me this way. And I've got your back forever. Uh, and, and when you think of it as a worship or a response to a God has, who has shown up and shown out in your life, yeah, it becomes a, more of that idea that Miller said. It becomes a life of freedom that really is abundant life. Yeah, that's really both. Thank you both for those. Uh, in the opening verse, I, the, um, verse three of chapter five, again, I learned this from Pat Miller, uh, who is my doctor father. Not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant, but with right. us who are all of us mm -hmm. here alive today. Now, um, this this version of the Ten Commandments, by the way, is not the first one at Horeb. I mean, at um, Sinai. Yes, which yeah, which is also called Horeb. Oh, Horeb. This is this is what uh, is that Mount Nebo? Nebo. Yes. Yeah, so I this is so. Deuteronomy five. All of the wilderness years have passed, right? And and all of the people who had originally been at Sinai have died. Uh, almost all, and now it's their children. So when when Moses says, "Not with our parents did the Lord make this covenant," and then it's incredibly emphatic in Hebrew, but with us, all of us here alive today, the living, and it's we read the Bible not to find out what God did for Moses, or as I like to say, David. Peter, Paul, and Mary, we read the Bible <laughs> to find out what God is doing for us. Mm -hmm. And so this covenant is still for us. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm, I'm acting like the, uh, the, the Today Show host. Uh, say one thing about one of the Ten Commandments that uh, you find powerful. Why don't you start, Joy? Well, I was, I was just thinking in the sense of... Um, this is a covenant that's different than the covenant that God has made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the one that God made with Noah. All of those were unconditional, and God keeps those. But what is happening with Israel at this point is a conditional covenant. Mm -hmm. you know, I have done this for you. Do this in return. And so that, that's how the law continues to play throughout, because they were breaking the law before they even had the law. Um, and 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 so the the life uh, the the life giving of the law is that it's something that you can't just check it off and say okay I went to Sabbath I'm done it's it's a keeping over and over again but if I had to choose uh, one that stands out it th this has to do with um, living into what uh, you said Miller talks about that this is how free people live I had a a student preach a sermon where they turned the Ten Commandments from don'ts to do's. And uh, one of them that was really significant is, uh, if you remember the way that Israel wound up in slavery, they wind up in slavery because a king arises who did not know Joseph, a king who didn't know the history. He didn't know his own history because the reason that Israel, I mean, that Egypt is successful is because of Joseph. But he also didn't know the history of the most populous people in his community, the Israelites. And because of that, he um, demeaned them because of their ancestry. You know, They're, so how, how were they singled out these descendants of, of, of Israel? And so one of the pieces of freedom is you are free 
to honor your ancestors. You're free to hmm. honor your mother and father. And I read this, and you two are Old Testament professors, so you can say if I'm taking too much homiletical license here, but I read that not just as be nice to your parents so that you can live a long life, but if you honor your ancestry, your family name begin is able to continue to exist with honor. I love that. Uh, yeah, I like that. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I like that. Yeah. So not just your immediate uh, parents, but your right. ancestors going back. Right, yeah, right. yeah cause they, why were they a bad people? Because they were a particular ethnicity. They were, they yeah. were Israelites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so honor that, live into that, because that's the promise of God. The promise of God is that Abraham and Sarah would have multiple descendants. And that's what Pharaoh, unknowing, because he doesn't know his history, he doesn't know. He's working against God when he starts trying to kill those Hebrew boys. Yeah, right. right, right. And so one of the freedoms that they have once they're free from Pharaoh's bondage is that they can honor their heritage again. That's awesome. Catherine. Catherine? All right. <laughs> Some, well, one, some, uh, some piece of wisdom about one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, one of my favorite commandments really is the Sabbath, and I've I've written about it and talked about it a lot. But that, uh, and it's the one that uh, I think our modern twenty four seven society really breaks every single day. Right? Yes. We even turn play into work, uh, and I and I'm as guilty as others. But I I just I love the radical nature of the Sabbath. Right. You are not God, so stop acting like it. Right? The world is going to keep turning if you take one day off and rest. And and it's Sabbath not just for people, but for the land later on, uh, or earlier actually in Exodus, it's Sabbath for slaves, uh, enslaved people. It's just a uh, it's just a beautiful concept that uh, that exhibits really radical trust in God. Right? That that the world is going that God's taking care of this world, and we don't have to be uh, you know working 24 7. and the and the motive clause in the sabbath commandment in deuteronomy is different than the one in exodus mm -hmm. right yeah right so in exodus it's because god rested on the seventh day in deuteronomy and this is really the the primary difference between those two iterations of the ten commandments in deuteronomy the reasoning is because you were slaves in the land of egypt therefore you know don't don't do this to uh, those who are uh, in your uh, under your responsibility. Your so so the Sabbath is not really for the, I mean, it is for the landowner and the, the head of the household, but really it's for the people under his authority. Uh, and it is his, you know, in the ancient world, uh, including livestock, right? And including uh, the foreigners who are in the household. So uh, everybody, gets to, everybody gets to rest. And the radical nature of that, when you think of how did um, how did Pharaoh respond? Um, he was okay. You're going to work harder with less, right? And their freedom is, you know what? You get to rest. Whoa. Well, That's yeah, radical. and the and the Deuteronomist uh, it, it refers to refers to Egypt as the iron furnace, right? Yeah. God brought the Israelites out of the iron furnace. It's this industrial society that burns up human labor for its huge monuments, right? And and so these people who are accustomed to having to work, you know, seven days a week are, are commanded to rest. Yeah, woo, radical. Yeah, yep. The, uh, my one bit of wisdom is, especially for people in my tradition, there are three traditions of numbering. Uh, the, in, the, in the Old Testament, they are referred to as the 10 words, mm -hmm. but they don't say which, they don't tell you how to number them. And so Jews, have one way of numbering them. Lutherans and Catholics and Episcopalians have another. And I think probably the the most authentic way to number them is actually probably the one that your tradition uses joy. And that is a separate commandment for the idol commandment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My tradition, it's considered part of the, um, you shall have no other gods, but then we don't actually put it in our catechism. So we skip it. So I think it's important for us to say, how do we make, how do we, what are the idols that we worship? What are the, what are the images of false gods we worship? And what are the false images of the true God that we worship? Uh, so 
But we better go to the great Shema, uh, oh. Deuteronomy 6, or obviously it could be, um, Catherine, you, or uh, Joy, you, um, observant pious Jews say this how many times a day? Do you remember? Uh, it's at I least twice. It, yeah, at least it's, twice. It's not three? Uh, maybe three. I should know that. But it is what's on the uh, tefillim, right? The, mm-hmm. uh, yes. Uh, the the um, little um, Tassel. containers on the on the forehead and on the arm, and then also on the, the doorpost door. of the house, right? That ah, comes from this bad. passage in Deuteronomy 6. So that's where uh, the, this, this, uh, the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is written on tiny scrolls and put in those in those little boxes. It is twice a day, by the way. Um, okay, thank you. But uh, but the point is, um, it's called the Great Shema because the first word here is uh, uh, Shema command. Listen, in a, right. uh, and it is Shema Israel, meaning hear, O Israel, and then this great phrase. The Lord, our God, the Lord, and then it's hard to translate. And then it says, you shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and all your might. This is the positive version of the negative first commandment. The negative first commandment, you shall have no other gods. Here's the positive thing. Love the Lord, your God. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, the Lord is our God. My new, the NRSV says the Lord alone um, mm-hmm. But I actually prefer the traditional understanding: the Lord is one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it's if if uh, if a Jewish person today knows no other uh, phrase in Hebrew, they're going to know this one. This is such an important, such a central uh, command and theme uh, uh, of the Jewish faith. So uh, we would, yeah, we would do well to uh, to pay it the uh, attention it deserves. In the- and. Yeah, and love the Lord your God, and talk about God, and teach your children, and uh, you know when you go out, when you come in, when you rise, when you go to sleep. Uh, this this love for God, uh, as Jesus says later when asked what the greatest commandment is, right? This is this should be the core reality, the core um, uh, claim on our lives, right? Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And that word here, um, listen. It it means actually in Hebrew listen and obey, right? Yeah. It's not just it's not just to hear it recited, it, but it's lived out.